I'm just going to take the shoes off. All right, so, uh, <laughs> sorry about this. Do you want to put them up on the desk and, and that's, that's no, that put them right here? No, that's really disturbing. Yeah, well, you're already halfway there. No, I'm going to put them uh, <laughs> so I, I uh, was. No, I was. They just, were even offending me. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Um, I was uh, a little bit. Uh, we've had a few people from the Goodman on in the past, and I. But I was a little bit intimidated by this. Uh, this interview, you know, you're, you're the artistic director of the Goodman. But then I, over the weekend, I was looking at your uh, Twitter feed, uh -huh. and you were th trying to think up uh, names of plays that Ron Jeremy could star in. That's right. And I think one of them was Pork Me and Bess. Yes. <laughs> yes, that was that was an inspired. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So after that, I. Felt I also liked Anthony in Cleopatra. <laughs> I interviewed Ron Jeremy once. Did you really? Super smart guy, yeah. super big dick. I wish this interview went so well. <laughs> but but I'm, so, I'm Irish. Please yeah. kiss me, I'm Irish. Yeah. So you're, di you're directing Romeo and Juliet at yeah. the Goodman? Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, yeah. We could go on and on, We could, actually, we could keep doing we? it. Uh, let me ask you about this, uh, this play that you're, you're directing, and that is I went on the Goodman site, and it said for mature audiences only. Yeah. And I, I thought, this is, not, this is not your father's Shakespeare, or, or your grandfather's, or great-great-grandfather's. No, or it's Ron Jeremy's Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. So why, why is that? What is it about Measure for Measure, or what is it about this production? And the video we, saw, we yeah, did not see you was sense. drenched in sex, and it showed that you're setting it in 1970s New York. So yeah. that maybe hints at it. Well, it does. I mean, you know, I don't know if you know the play at all, I do. Uh, you do. I read well, it. I read it this week. You read the play. Yeah. It's it's a uh, it's a very complicated and sort of contemporary play. It's actually in many ways his most contemporary play, and it itself is drenched in sex. Uh, it's, there are it's some great terms for sex in this. It has. Play. Oh my God! You know, throw a coin in her clap dish. <laughs> that's that's a good one. Uh, There's one about trout. Oh, that's right. It's it's groping in a river for trout. Yeah, peculiar trout. Pecu you, excellent, yeah. excellent. And unfortunately, if you're a Shakespearean actor, the only way you can illustrate those things is you say, groping in the river for peculiar trout. <laughs> so it's called humpy acting. So it's the only way to get through Shakespeare's puns, which are all very dirty, but you have to accompany them by a gesture. The play was written in 1604, and he said it in Vienna, okay? And there's a lot of talk about the Duke of Vienna and all of this stuff, but it's really about Shakespeare's time, 1604. And it's about uh, prostitution. It's about, uh, it's about licentious sex and disease that is going through the city. It's, it's about alcoholism. It's about uh, violence towards women. It's about, you know, it's about power. It's also about religion. And it's a comedy. And it's a comedy, although it's a black, black, dark. It's, it's, I, I actually think it's the death of comedy. It's Shakespeare's death of comedy play. He actually never wrote a comedy after this one. They call it, or he, I don't know if he called it, but it's called a problem play? Yeah. What, is that, what are the other ones, and what does that mean? Oh, it, 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 what it really means is that Shakespeare's, uh, you know, he... His plays were titled by an editor. He himself didn't actually call them comedies or dramas or anything. It was by editors uh, years later. And they would term them comedies or drama, uh, tragedies or histories. And they had no categories for anything else that didn't quite fit that. And so there's about five, four plays of his that are, were, were called literally in the 19th century problem plays. Because they're, they're what we now are very familiar with. They're, they're black comedies. You know, they're, they're very dark, they're very disturbing. Uh, you know, they're drenched in either violence or sexuality or moral ambiguity, you know, moral ambiguity. Uh, and this play is one of them. And I just decided that the play fits extremely well for 1970s New York. It's also about a city that's on the verge of collapse, and it's about the Duke or a mayor who can't handle it, and he leaves it. And, 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 it, it, it just reminded me of the 1970s when the city of New York sure. was on complete collapse. President to New York dropped dead. President to New York dropped Ford. It was Ford, actually. Ford to New York dropped dead. 
And the city, you know, it was 42nd Street. Uh, it was garbage strikes. It was the son of Sam. It was about rioting. It was about looting. And it was also about really what became uh, the HIV epidemic that was really beginning. Uh, and, and similarly in this play, there's disease running through the city. But it really, you know, the thing that really, and ultimately the, the main plot point is about a very powerful politician who basically says uh, to a nun whose brother is in jail for impregnating a woman, he basically says to her, you know what, if you give up your virginity to me, I will let your brother live. And it's about this very powerful man, you know, uh, uh, basically attacking this powerless young woman. But what really, what really struck me about the play, uh, what makes it very modern, unfortunately, is that this power thing goes on all the time, was I thought of uh, Eliot Spitzer, uh, you know, this sort of upright uh, citizen, you know, the governor of New York, the former, you know, attorney general, basically addicted to prostitutes. Uh, and sort of hiding behind a sort of proper, very moral exterior, but having this sort of secret life, which is sort of part of the play and its images we use. And I also thought about the Dominic Strauss-Kahn case of, of what happens when a man of extraordinary power goes into a room, you know, uh, with somebody of less power. And in that case, even more interesting, because we never really quite know, you'll never know what happens between two people in any room. And, and you never quite know what was going on. So I took all of those images and I sort of scored it to... Uh, Donna Summer and the Rolling Stones. Well, you, you, you and, bring, and then you create this very visceral new production. You, you bring up an interesting point, which is that you've said it in the 70s, and, and that obviously makes complete sense. Well, to you and I, it makes complete sense. And to everybody here as yeah. well. And to, to this yeah. very articulate point. And if they had seen the video, it would have made even more. <laughs> but, but there's obviously, whenever you do a Shakespeare play, I would imagine, yeah. or any play, but yeah. particularly here, particularly an old play, you want to somehow also make, have it resonate with the world today. Oh, yeah. So, so the 70s weren't today, but, but what is it about Measure for Measure that, that kind of speaks to what's going on Well, now? it's close enough. You know, as opposed to 400 years away, it's only 30 or 40 years away. So that, you know, it's, it's the last production I did was a production of King Lear, which, 2006, yeah, 2006, which people which, screamed about pro and con. It was very, very controversial for very similar reasons. And it, too, was sort of, uh, for me, I find most Shakespeare unbelievably boring, quite frankly. And, and <laughs> it Seeing is, it or, or reading it? Uh, well, uh, I reading it and seeing it. I mean, reading it, I have to really struggle, like kind of line by line to understand what's going on. And I go, if I have to struggle, yeah. how does an audience hearing it for the first time really understand? And I think we're, we all live under this myth that Shakespeare is good for you yeah. in some way. Like it's, uh, you know, it's just really, and it is, but, but it's difficult going, I think. And so to me, th the key to a Shakespeare production is it has to be contemporary. It has to be modern. It has to speak to us. The plays, of course, do. It's 400 years away, but there's a sort of bit of dust that has sort of gathered on it that needs to be kind of blown off in order to make it fresh. And uh, the Lear that I did was set in, in sort of the dissolution of, of Yugoslavia, of the wars in 1999. And it just, you can certainly, you know, I don't know if this will work. Honestly, God, you never know. But it's an attempt to sort of really get inside the play. And I hope it's not a matter of just sort of overlaying a sort of concept on it. It's about a way of getting really deep into the play. And these plays, which are really dark and very, dis when I talk about Shakespeare, his plays are often, you know, I call them pumpkin pants productions, you know, and everybody's running around for sooth and this and that. And they're very dark, they're very disturbing, they're sort of sexually driven and violent. And it's really helpful, I think, to sort of present it in, in images and, and thoughts that reflect how we live today. Granted, we don't actually live the same way in 700 years uh, in, 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 as we did in the 70s, but it's a lot closer than 400 years. What's, the, what's, what's a Shakespeare play that, is there any Shakespeare play that you think is just bad? This is a terrible play. Oh, that, my God. Two Gentlemen of Verona is just god I awful. love Two Gentlemen. Oh, it's no, I just awful. Just <laughs> it's just, just awful don't, play. You don't know I that don't play. Know. I have no idea. I've heard of it. Yeah, I've heard I'm, of it, yeah. too. I've yeah. Never read it, but I hear it's bad. <laughs> uh, you, you've been at the Goodman for, for 60 years now? About 60. Yeah. When you started, where was uh, Chicago? What, what, if somebody had gone to sleep in 1986 and woken up, today, 
what would they say? Oh my God, the Goodman is now this as opposed to what it was then. I, it's older now than it was then. Yeah. You know, I, you know, the thing about it is I've actually, I ran a theater, you know, for many years on Howard Street uh, in Chicago. It was a 150 seat theater up on Howard Street. And that began like, a, yeah, somebody remember that? Wisdom Bridge Theater. Yeah, yeah. Always exciting to be remembered. You did it. You, it? You, you, well, I, I, people still talk of uh, Ham Hamlet. Hamlet there. Well, that's, that's sort of been, yeah, I mean, that's, I've only directed like in my life, and it's a 30 year career, four Shakespeare productions. Yeah. So I don't do because them you, very often. Because you hate him. I generally find him, diff no, I actually, I, I actually, Shakespeare is the greatest writer in the English language, maybe the greatest writer ever. But I just, it, 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 it never, I go, and it just, it's boring so yeah. often. Yeah. You know, it's just boring. Yeah. And, and, it's and. playing at the Goodman yeah. from March 9th to. And safe. You know, that's what I mean. They're safe yeah. productions so that I've tried to shake it up, and sometimes it's successful, and sometimes they're just horrible. And sometimes like King Lear, and I'm sure this production, people w will think they like it, and they don't like it, but that's. That's it. You know, it's like when you go see Shakespeare and everybody goes, oh, that was really great. I, I, it usually means it's really terrible. <laughs> Do, don't you think? Sometimes you go and you're like, oh, it's boring. You've, uh, you've, you've been, uh, I guess, let's put away Shakespeare for a second. You've kind of become the guy who brings back Eugene O'Neill. And of yeah. course, there was just the Iceman cometh. Talk about, and you can talk about it with this play too, Talk about the, we come, we go see the play, and we either enjoy it or we say it's really great, and then we leave, but that's it for us. We might think about it a little bit, we might say, we might recommend it to somebody, but talk about the process, and I know that's a big word, but talk about just, like, going on right now, maybe for measure for measure. What is happening? What are people doing in the cast and the direction? Is, is it emotionally draining to put on a play? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's it's it it is. I mean, that's what's wonderful is that you know it's it's the, it's wonderful and it's it's exhausting, but it's the greatest job in the world in many ways. I mean, it, it, for me, it is because you you create this very safe environment of a rehearsal room, and actors come into it, and they have to do things that most human beings do not do, which is they have to sort of tear themselves apart emotionally, to sort of you know touch the human condition, to sort of go places that are cathartic. For, I mean, we go to the theater because we generally want to experience an emotion that we ourselves experience, but we want to experience on a greater level. We want to, we want to have a, a cathartic response to, to the work that we see. And in order to do that, the actors have to really go very deeply into themselves to sort of, you know, I mean, just to sort of find things about how they feel about other people. How do they feel about love? How do they feel about aging? How do they feel about pain? How do they feel about humiliation? And they have to sort of go through that themselves. And a director's job is to create this very, very safe environment by which people can really experiment and really kind of go that way. I mean, I started my, my question with Iceman because that is such, to, to even to watch yeah, it obviously yeah. is emotionally draining. I can't even imagine what it's like to to rehearse and then do that night after night. Do you ever tap, you know, tap one of the actors and say, are you okay? Sometimes, but not often. I mean, generally, the rehearsals themselves are where you're discovering and you're digging. You're, you're digging. You're kind of discussing it, and then you're digging and you're experimenting. By the time it gets in front of an audience, it becomes something more celebratory and sharing for an audience. I'm not saying, and this isn't therapy. You know, that's, people think it's like therapy in a way. It isn't. But you're, you're working with the play, and you're trying to uncover it, and you're trying to personalize it. And every actor is going to bring something different to it. The rehearsal rooms are very volatile places in many ways. I mean, they're, you know, people are, but at the same time, with a great deal of love, and a great deal of sharing, and a great deal of exploration. By the time it gets in front of an audience, it, there's a pleasure that's had in doing it. It may be tiring, but, you know, I always say, you know, people, oh, aren't you exhausted? And you go, well, you know, no. I mean, really, yes, but it's two hours a night those actors are working. Everybody else is working eight-hour, 10-hour days, 12-hour days. Those actors, they're very focused for two hours, three hours. Iceman Cometh was five hours, <laughs> you know, it's by incredible. putting that on. 
But there's something very cathartic for them and sort of exhilarating and pleasurable, actually, by the time they put it on in front of an audience. It's like a pleasure to be had with sharing it, where it's actually kind of painful and difficult and also great, great, to sort of discover it when you're in the rehearsal room. Last question. We had uh, Brian Dennehy on the show, and he was great and drunk. Um, <laughs> have, have you ever had a, a disagreement with him? Oh, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Tell me the best. Tell me the best. Oh, God, I, I wish I could tell you. God, there's so many, because I've worked with him for like 30 years. I wish, he questions everything. You know, it's one of those people that, you know, ultimately I've learned if I want him to go right, I say, Brian, why don't you go, you know, <laughs> why, why don't you go left? And he'll be like, oh, fuck you. I feel like going right. <laughs> and so, oh, all right, try it. <laughs> that's good. That's good. You know, that's really great, Brian. You know, I think the scene is best played sort of, you know, with a sort of edge of comedy. Ah, fuck you, it's tragic, it's tragic. And that's what I was trying to get him to do, was to go tragic. So it's every single moment is like that with Brian. With Brian. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks. And, uh, Thanks a lot. Yeah.